Yeah, you saw the walkout. That, that was, was class, was wasn't it? It was good. It was very, very good. Every news channel that was covering it, everyone cut outside. Which was, I mean, brilliant that they, they cut to him. It was outside the front of the parliament, everyone's in the background. And it got the agenda on the table because th- there was no coverage in the media about the EU withdrawal bill that happened the night before. None at all after that. It just I shows mean, you how yeah. fucking awful it is that they have to do something like that to get anything in the media, especially Scotland, that basically there's a massive power grab on what should be new devolved powers. I think they've played the game long enough in the Commons mm-hmm. to, to warrant some sort of alternative action. These fucking Tories complaining about, oh, it was staged, it was this going like, have you seen the amount of staged manufactured crap? Like, you're you're the most manufactured fucking party in the world. I mean, Ruth Davidson was kicking off about it, going like, you did a photo shoot on top of a fucking tank. <laughs> I think she's run out of photo shoots. What else she, can she do? Where'd you go from Buffalo? She's riding the Buffalo, she's giving out ice creams. Aye. She's driving a tank. I know, it's terrible, these politicians doing a scripted thing. You're like, for fuck's sake. You well, know? The one thing they levelled against them was that they did the sort of whole media round immediately afterwards of, as if they'd had that all in place. But the media are always on that green. Yeah. And when it when it cut to the lobby, it literally just went to the BBC guy's face and he said to the camera, what do I do? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Ian Blatford's yeah. done quite well like I never really rated him when he got the position and I think they really missed Angus Robertson but I think he handled that really well as well to be fair to both of them it doesn't matter what they ask Theresa May they never get an answer no so like people were saying oh they oh so our Scottish MPs just gave away our questions and it's like well they wouldn't have got an answer so they've actually made headline news with you know a significant issue so I've I've watched PMQs probably Every week since May 2015. God help you. I know. It's, <laughs> it's why I am the way I am. Um, it's why I've lost all tone in my voice. Um, she is useless. She is completely not very good at answering questions. Anytime she will answer a question with any substance, she will bring it back to independence in some way. She will not answer any question. So to then turn around and say that, oh, you had three questions on the order paper, you didn't get to ask them, it's like, well, you know. Well, it's the Ruth Davidson tactic in reverse, because Ruth's whole thing is, if I talk about independence, it makes Sturgeon have to talk about it. So they know on the media highlight packages what it will look like is, here's Nicola talking about independence again, even though she's not the one who brought it up. But it's the same thing down there in Prime Minister's questions, where Ian Blackford can ask anything he wants. And as long as she, that's the response that she gives, the media again can present the idea that the SNP only ever talk about independence, which isn't true. They talk about it a lot, but they also make a hell of a lot of more valid points. It's not all centred on that. So it is, it's a tactic uh, deliberately deployed by the Tories to create this veneer that the SNP are obsessed with independence, which they are, but they're not that obvious about it. But even though, like, well, I joined the SNP again off the back of it, but if you look at the other Scottish MPs, in what way did they ever represent Scotland now? They're not. The Tories are very much in the Tory party. The Labour ones, you don't even hear anything out of them. And then you've got, what's her face? Who's the Lib Dem? Uh, Christine... Joe Swinson? Oh, Joe Swinson. Who yeah. uh, just abstains and then says, oh, I'm doing it to uh, because of Wales or something. Is that a reasoning? <laughs> the problem is Labour's absolute refusal to create uh, any kind of left-wing coalition. I remember when uh, there was the the uh, leaders' debate, party leaders' debate in 2015, and it was uh, Nicola Sturgeon and Leanne Wood... Um, the leader of the Greens at the time, the Australian woman, I think, has now stood down. Natalie Bennett. Oh, Natalie Bennett. Yeah. And it was the three of them. And then we had Ed Miliband and Nigel Farage. And the women were tremendous because throughout the show, they were kind of picking at Ed, going like, well, Ed, if you would just join us, we can beat everybody. Like, together we can accomplish this. Progressive Alliance, is what, that was the big pitch. And at the end of the show, Nicola basically says to Ed, you know, join us, this, this will be great. And... I always think of it as Nicola being the quarterback. He's like, Ed, go long, and throws the ball, and he just fucking fumbled it. Because the second he went, I can't do that, Nicola, I can't do it, like, you just knew the election was fucking dead for Labour. Because what's the point? Because unless you have that united front, you know, it's never going to make a difference. And the same thing's happened under Corbyn, because Corbyn attacked the SNP long before the SNP ever criticised Corbyn. I supported Corbyn for a long time on the basis that I thought he was a relatively decent, honest guy that would be open to working with the SNP. And he had said words to that effect prior. 
and then just turned on them and went gunning for their seats in Scotland and just turned into somewhat of an arsehole. And uh, that's the problem now. If you don't have that united coalition, which would solve everything, you're fucked. But I think uh, Miliband and Corbyn, or Labour, they've obviously weighed up that that is worse for their, their voting than actually going for that strong unionist voice. I think the Labour Party has a real aversion towards nationalism. I don't know if that's because the Labour Party is socialist and therefore you have national socialists, not a great combination of words or whatever else it is, but, <laughs> you know, uh, that was the way I always read it. They were very much party before country, I think, um, and they seem to have demonstrated that quite spectacularly the last couple of elections. It's all the English electorate's fault, though. Like You get these left-wing English people having a go at us. It's like, how about you get your own country not to vote Tory all the time? <laughs> not our fault we're trying you should vote Labour and then we'll get in charge it's like there's only been like there's only like one election in the last 50 years where Scottish MPs actually swung it for the government but they keep blaming us for voting the SNP when they are just a mess it just pisses me off too because the thing the SNP rise happened I don't want to say overnight it, it didn't but I mean we, we'd really turned this country from being Labour to the SNP with one election like that's all it took to get our shit together and the way England just seems to kind of bitch at us constantly for like, why are you doing that? It's like, well, like we can do it. You can do it as well. Like, you don't have to have this totally defeatist attitude all the time. But the walkouts, I mean, do you reckon, what, so what's the long-term effect? You've rejoined the SNP. I have, yeah. So there's a huge spike in membership. It's something insane, like 8,000 uh, members or something. What is it, it's over 10,000? Yeah. Uh, it's, mm-hmm. I think it must be more than the Tories now because they were only about 4,000 behind. So what's the next move? How do they capitalise on it? Do that every time. Yeah. Just walk out every question time. <laughs> Fuck this. I mean, the walkout for all... OK, it's garnered the, the public attention that they wanted from it, that we wanted from it. It hasn't really changed the established narrative of Brexit, has it? In the minds of the Tories or whoever's negotiating. It's not really going to really achieve anything. I was just going to say, we're kind of saying, where's the momentum going? But it's it's kind of stuck just with Brexit because Brexit isn't going anywhere. Yeah. I still, I, I don't know if it's true, I still foresee that the, when when Brexit's clear and what's happening, that's when you might start to see that pick up again. Mm. Because people, you're just, you're in a limbo. Everyone's in this limbo trying to decide what's going to happen. But within that limbo, the there's been no sort of impact in terms of the walkout. There's been no indication from the Tories that they're going to pay any heed to respecting devolution or, or whatever. So I think you're right. I think it's going to come to the stage where come the autumn when Brexit's more clear than that, that will be the time. I still have doubts Brexit will happen or it will get delayed or pushed forward, as Danny Dyer was saying the other day. Brexit thing when 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 mm. you know you're judging them on, on on Brexit they don't know nothing about it who knows about Brexit yeah quite uh, no one's got a f***ing clue what Brexit mm. is yeah you watch Question Time it's comedy well you know clearer when Jeremy Corbyn no I got the clue no one knows what it is it's like this mad riddle that no one knows mm. what it is right so what's happened to that twat David Cameron oh. who called it on <laughs> let's be fair oh. I think what? you're referring no, to no, our no, former prime no, minister no. yeah but why the, how comes he can scuttle off he called all this on mm. yeah yeah he, he has on. no regrets Where's, where is he he's in Europe in Nice with his trotters up, yeah? Where is the geezer? I think he should be held accountable for it. You know what? Think he should be held you know accountable. Where is the twat? It's great. But it just it just shows you how it takes like this, a, a really silly moment like that to sum up the mood of everyone. We kind of level a lot of the blame at the current crop of Tories, yet Cameron and Osborne, who are just as personally responsible for all of this as anyone else, have kind of got away scot-free. And I thought, I was sitting there thinking... God, that's a good point. That's not one that I've ever actually thought. We've just we've moved so quickly. David Cameron, last I heard of him, he's sitting in a fucking 50 grand shed in his garden writing a book. And you're just going, this is all your fault, you bastards. It was all for him to, like, quell this, like, side of the Tory party. Yeah. And it's just completely debil- and debilitated to, the whole country. And to stave off the UKIP vote as well. And it goes back further than that because also he was the one that greenlit the 2014 referendum as well. So, I mean, if you actually, a lot of these questions that didn't even really have to be questions, he made this all an issue. So, I mean, if you actually, hist- I reckon historically the breakup of the UK is now inevitable. And when you look back, he will be pinpointed as the reason for it. That I think historically he'll be known as the guy that took, uh, caused Scottish independence, took the UK out of Europe, and caused the breakup of the UK, ending hundreds of years of, of the United Kingdom. 
through one man's utter pig shagging incompetence, I, and that I think I'm convinced that is how he is going to be remembered, and that's why the guy's in fucking hiding because he probably, he probably knows himself that is inevitably going to become his legacy. Remember when he he did his final little talk outside Downing Street and he had that little whistle? <laughs> he was going do 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 do. The whole the rest of Britain is just burning and sinking into the <laughs> the sea. <laughs> Right. The the situation British politics is in, I find very funny in that you've got Theresa May, who is a Remainer, trying to push for Brexit, when you've got Corbyn pretending he's a Remainer but wants to leave. <laughs> and at any other time, having having a left-wing socialist leader of Labour is like the dream, apart from now, when he's pushing for his own kind of ideological view of getting rid of the EU. It really just shows how much a lack of honesty can totally fuck up a country. You know, two liars. And you know And then they've got Scotland just in the corner there going, Fuck you <laughs> <laughs> Say what you mean, you dicks <laughs> yeah. What would happen if Corbyn went hard Briggs and just went fuck it, he just came out of the closet and finally went, You know what? It's a neoliberal shithole and I want out What would happen? He's pretty much said that in subtle ways, but but not. It, maybe he should be clearer. Actually, the other night on the same show, he was he was like, "My Brexit is like out the customs union, blah blah blah." He's basically saying, "Yeah, I want a hard Brexit." Yeah, he's he's hedging his bets, doesn't he? <laughs> he doesn't want to lose the the right wing of his party. He still needs them, even if he hates them. And uh, that kind of like shows me that he's not the kind of honest guy that people have assumed that he was. He's full of it when it comes to Brexit. He just, he just try to play both sides. That's the worst bit. At all. Yeah, that's the worst bit about him because, like, with Nicola, you can kind of see right off the bat she's quite centrist and balanced and reasonable, and and she, but she's never really tried to present herself as this wee rebel of the working class socialist front, whatever thing. Whereas with Corbyn, what annoys me about him is the way that he absolutely is presenting himself as being that as this great revolutionary savior, and the minute it's like, right, do it, go on. And nothing, like nothing at all has happened with that. And I think that the, S- the SNP have always, I don't have to agree with them a lot, but I kind of respect them because I don't see them as being charlatans. I think what you see is kind of what you get. Whereas with Corbyn, he is absolutely capitalised on the back of something that he is absolutely not. Like he has played this punk socialist character. And when it's actually come down to crunch time, he's just not delivered. And that really know. sucks. I've said it on this podcast before, but Corbyn should just lie. Like, like no no but like it's like everyone lies like it should just be like oh yeah no um we're the party of remain uh we'll have another election and then once he gets in power just go actually i'm going to respect the vote of the people but, but why can't he that's just... not what i want he should just do it or, or he, he wouldn't even have to lie he could just stand up and go you know what actually at one time i did just think that the eu was this horrible neoliberal nightmare actually now though i've learned quite a lot about it and I've understood that I was wrong. What, that was like a three-second thing to say into a camera, and boom, your problem's fucking solved. But this kind of like, oh, I might be for leave. Oh, I might be for remain. Like, that's... I don't understand. It's that kind of... Uh, 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 you should just be totally thing. honest and yeah. be like, listen, we're all, like, really ugly and pale, and uh, <laughs> Europeans are sexy, and so we're, we're going to stay in the EU. People just need to be told that we're all ugly and we need to mix up the gene pool, and that's a vote winner. Absolutely, yes. I want us all, the human race should all turn into a big, sexy shade of brown. That's my, my long-term <laughs> ambition for it. I think racism is the one problem we should be able to fuck our way out of. That's my plan. <laughs> for Corbyn to come out and support Remain, even disingenuously, would suppose that the electorate in the rest of the UK, certainly, would vote Remain again. I don't think they fucking would. I think the reasons why they voted leave in the first place would be the reasons why they vote leave in the second place. Even yeah, that's if, what even I if they know it's going to be a total economic shitstorm. The reason Brexit happened was because they don't want foreigners next door. Let's be I, uh, let's be perfectly I reasonable here. If they have a second referendum, I think Remain would win, but I think it would be very, very close. I put it I put it down to uh, leave voters dying in between. The two referendums, that's all I put it down to. I don't no, think any mindsets will be changed. I just think some baby boomers might kick uh, the bucket. You're completely correct in that, let's say, roughly 48% of people that voted leave are doing it because they hate foreigners. So there's like a little few percent of people that are actually 
process the facts. Some people, some people always say when they say things like that, "Oh, it's not all the Leave voters." I'm fucking saying it. <laughs> <laughs> the ones that say it's not about immigration to me, it doesn't take long <laughs> for you to pull something out of them that actually is about immigration. There's so few that have the the sovereignty of Parliament argument. It really is like one in a hundred. It's like that one percent. The people that have argued that so there's a guy next to I sit next to in work that's argued this. It's about sovereignty. It's about getting our powers back in Brussels. Fuck them. And is also in the same breath advocating, no, we have to centralise everything to Westminster. And you're like, D- do you not? <laughs> Where is the consistency of logic in this? Because the people that are for yes and also for Brexit, I have a level of sympathy with. Because if you want to argue that, I just want to get power down to the smallest level possible, fuck all the government, get rid of you. I actually think that I can see a logic thread there. The ones that I do not understand is the fuck centralising power to Brussels but it's fine to do that at Westminster I don't understand where the fuck these people are coming from with that it's like surely if it's about sovereignty it should be about sovereignty for all the parliaments all individuals whatever else but one of the problems is like every western country the economy has been based on immigration for like decades and they like not only did they contribute tax but they fill up key roles whether it's like healthcare or fruit pickers and to actually just cut that off is a disaster for the country. Like, it's, you know. If it wasn't a positive thing, I don't think we'd have done it to start with. I mean, across the board, humans in every country have gone, actually, humans from elsewhere can do stuff. And we've all kind of just quietly agreed, this is probably quite a good idea. And it is really mental that there's this tiny, say, minority. In Scotland, it certainly is a minority. But of people that think that's now a bad thing for some inexplicable reason because they've failed in life. <laughs> yeah, it was the main reason I didn't vote actually, because I was I'm more on the kind of leave side, you know, in terms of like the economics and the well, not really the sovereignty thing, but just like getting rid of an extra parliament. <laughs> I think it's like unnecessary. There's a lot of things that I agree with, but the immigration thing was important to me and and keeping it keeping free movement. So that's why I, one of the main reasons I didn't vote in the end. Mm-hmm. Just. Uh, that's just such a loss such a brilliant freedom we've got to be able to move around just the so Daily Mail will be the first to complain about it I think they already did actually talking about the passport queues like, proud <laughs> Brits will have to wait in one hour queue you're like yeah that's what you voted for you stupid fucks <laughs> so uh, we to bring us back to the walkout then so uh, I think the Parliament ca- is a pantomime it's just a big show and you know you guys are saying yeah all these questions they ask, and never get an answer. It's just a farce. So I think you know when you're in a farce, just make it even more of a farce. Just like, I mean, the Tories use all these stupid arcane rules to keep out bills that they don't like and stuff like that. You know, so yeah, go for it, SMP. Just like find all the arcane rules you can in the rule book and just throw every spanner in the works you possibly can. Just make it a complete disaster area. Make sure nothing can get done. Yeah. That was my plan in 2015 when we first sent down like the 56, just bam them up. I kind of want Scotland to be this annoying wee Ned of the international community. If anyone else is being a dick, our job is to call it out and <laughs> just be this difficult bunch of cunts because <laughs> we're really good at it. Next time, they shouldn't, uh, they shouldn't go out in a one They should all have to be uh, sent out one by one. <laughs> yeah. So it takes like about 10 hours to go through all. I wanted a conga line. That's what I wanted. <laughs> Quite like that. Have a wee dance on the way out the door. I wish they still had the big 56. That would have been good. Mm. The numbers have dwindled a bit. But yeah, just have it, everyone individually sent out. <laughs> Call Berklow a cunt. Oh, hey, Berklow! <laughs> Wear a hat. All these different rules are the things you're not allowed to do. Not. Uh-huh. Well, this well, is, they've yeah. tried to, no, the SNP, they tried to fit in and be professional, but they're almost a bit, they've almost been a bit too nice and formal about everything, haven't they? You actually said, Fergus, you said something at the part, start of this, and I thought that was a good point we all made, where like, they've given it enough time. Yeah. I, think, I think for a while, when they went down, because people have complained about that, oh, they're playing by the rules too much, but they had to. Because they, they had to go down and demonstrate that they were well, they were willing to do it, and now I think enough time has elapsed where they've not been treated with respect mm. to then fucking kick off. And I think it's justified now. Support for devolution in Scotland is still very very high. Like, I think it was up it was an up about eighty percent or something. So if you're if you're going to attack the parliament, even if it's subtly over time, like there is, the vast majority of the Scottish population still want the parliament. This was Labour's project. You know, this wasn't it wasn't the SNP that got us the Scottish Parliament. 
they would have helped enormously along the way, I'm sure. But you know, it was Donald Dewar, you know, and the Labour side of it that led this to happen. So the way they've tried, I think, tried to spin this into like, here's us taking down the SNP. It's like, well, actually, no, it was a, a kind of non-nationalistic thing when it actually happened. It was, it was about, did you say, devolution. It wasn't about independence at that what point. Was it? Did, it was inevitable uh, it would become about independence. I think everyone probably knew that quite at the like back Donald, of the head. That was, I didn't know this until after the, the walkout, but then um, Dewar had led, led all the Scottish Labour MPs out of the Parliament, I think, mm. in the 80s, a protest about Scottish issues not being raised and Mm-hmm. addressed properly it'd be interesting to see what someone like Dewar would make of the current situation like if he's still alive would he be? Would he still be against the SNP just on that principle or would he be a, more of a proponent of devolution? That is a really intriguing question I, I don't know enough about the guy to say. Like I don't know if his whole ambition was to actually curb independence or whether he was more of a sort of home rule. I mean you could argue that what the real elements, if you like, of the Scottish Labour Party became the SNP. They all jumped. So I, I don't think it's out with the realms of possibility based on what's happened that a Donald Dewar would certainly consider jumping to at least the yes side, if not completely to the SNP altogether. Well, Henry McLeish is always kind of flirting, isn't he? Mm-hmm. So. There's quite a bit, there's a few of them. I mean, there's that, the endless Doug deal conspiracy that either she's a double agent or she is eventually going to jump. And I'm still quietly confident that will happen eventually. I think she will come out in favour of yes. I don't think people will know until I've already mentioned until the the Brexit thing's clear, because then then you have to actually make a kind of yes or no call based on the two directions. But did Doug Dale not have a quote where she said that she would consider voting yes, depending on what the Brexit situation was? I could have made this up. I'm sure there was a newspaper interview or something that she did. Where she said this would the, basically the result, what's happened now with Brexit would make her pause for thought and how she would vote in a second referendum. I still think she'll eventually jump it to me. Yeah. Anyway, so walk out, but we'll wrap this thing up. Um, final thoughts: what that means for the future, more of it, less of it. I think we're all in favour of them just causing a hassle. Cool. Just keep bamming them up. Mayhem. Mayhem. Yeah. More chaos. <laughs> I think if if Brexit is going to be the launching pad for another independence referendum, I don't think there was a great amount of public knowledge about the reasons why there is room to sort of reject what's happening with Brexit from a devolution standpoint. It has been kind of painted as ironically, SNP troublemaking, just trying to find any excuse they can for a, a second referendum. Whereas the walkout has, I think, made people realise that there is substance to this, there is a principle to this that doesn't necessarily 100% have to lead to a referendum, but, you know, we disagree with this. Our voices aren't being heard. There was a guy uh, I work with um, who caught the coverage of the walkout and went into this anti-SNP tirade, but then I explained to him the reason for the walkout. And what was interesting about that was he knew nothing about the withdrawal bill. So I just said to him, but do you realise what happened last night? And he had no idea. And once I explained that to him, it, he became sympathetic to what had happened. So it, it worked in that sense that you have people that would be absolutely anti-SNP suddenly going, well, Bit of a dickhead move, but ah no, I can see why he did it, and I think maybe that's why the SNP have had that enormous jump in support because I think even if you are not a yes voter, and not even that into politics, you can understand in principle why they did what they did. Yeah, my office is kind of the same in that they're all I think they all kind of lean yes, but they only ever talk about politics when there's like a big headline like that. So no one's talking about the withdrawal bill, but they'll talk about the SNP leaving. And then why did they do that? And then, you know, so that's it's a great success, really.